thank you, Pascal, for agreeing to serve as discussant, and thank you, everybody, for coming out during uh, midterm week, right? Um, so I'm not going to, you know, I was asked to talk about 35 minutes. I'll probably talk a little bit short, for, you know, for a lesser amount so that we can enjoy the Q&A and some discussion, hopefully. Um, so I was asked, as Kerry pointed out, to discuss the Pew report on Muslim, the Muslim population and the, the growth of the Muslim population. And in the report, so how did we get from that to the growth of Arab youth population? Well, you know, the, I can only talk for so long about Muslim demographics, so we, we'll cover that briefly and we'll segue into then the, the, the Muslim youth population. From there, we'll go on to the, uh, the Arab population and talk and link it up to maybe discussions about the Arab Spring. And I'd be more than happy to come back to the macro um, as, the, as the talk progresses. If anything doesn't make sense, please feel free to stop me and we can basically talk about it. I think one of the, 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 the big accomplishments of the Pew Report, as Carrie pointed out, was this idea that for a while, especially after 9-11, there was this you know, growing concern that the Muslims were sweeping the globe not necessarily through expansion, ten, expansionist tendencies, but through the demographic threat. And we, we heard this over and over, especially when um, there are debates about um, Muslim integration into Western societies, especially Europe, that by, I saw estimates all over the place personally that you know, by the year 2030, 30% 30 of Europe would be Muslim or 40% of Muslim, uh, Europe would be Muslim. And you know, we can just say, well, so what? But, the truth is, in certain audiences, that was you know giving people uh, you know serious issues to think about. Um, that you know th that the, the Muslims were sweeping the globe demographically. So one of the th these studies, I mean, what the Pew Research Center um, and their Religious Life Program, what it's been doing is basically surveying or trying to map out religious communities across the globe. So this is not unique to the Muslim population, but we're focusing on the Muslim uh, aspect of the report for today's talk and. Um, it, it did receive a lot of attention in the media. So let me just give you a sense of what the Muslim population globally looks like, and then we can have a conversation about how that links into current trends or, or where, if you may, the hysteria is coming from about uh, the Muslim demographic threat, if you may, supposed, alleged Muslim demographic threat. So if you look at Muslim population and regional distribution, what you see is that two-thirds of all Muslims worldwide, more or less, live in 10 countries. Six of those countries are in Asia, so predominantly the, the Muslim population is Asian, is of Asian or origin. It's Indonesian, it's Pakistani, it's Indian, Bangladesh, uh, from Bangladesh, from Iran, from Turkey. And three of the largest Muslim concentrations are actually in North Africa, which are Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco, and one is in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is Nigeria. So of, among those 10 countries, they absorb about two-thirds of the entire Muslim population. The world's Muslim population is expected to increase by about 35% in the next 20 years, rising from 1.6 billion in 2010 to 2.2 billion by 2030. This is now according to the new population projections by the Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion and Public Life. So globally, the Muslim population is forecast to grow at about twice the rate of the non-Muslim population. The Muslim population growth rate for the next two decades is, is going to be about 1.5%, whereas the non-Muslim population growth rate is projected to be at 0.7%. So if, if, if everything works out according, according to these demographic formulas, and we can talk about what's going into these demographic formulas, they include things like um, the youth bulge now, where the youth population is, they, they take into account levels of education because as women get more educated, they have less children. It takes into account some socioeconomic factors. It also takes into account, um, you know, the, the natural decline um, of, of, of fertility as certain socioeconomic factors emerge in certain societies. And it also takes into account immigration. If you factor all these things together, um, Muslims will make up 26.4% of the entire world population in 2030, and that will be up from 23.4%. So basically, the, the, if, you, if you may, although the Muslim population is, is growing very fast, although it's outpacing other groups, the truth of the matter is, give, with all of that uh, growth and, 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 and outpacing and the higher fertility, fertility rates and whatnot, the projections still say that basically by the year 20, 2030, 
The Muslim population will be at 26.4%. Currently, it's at 23.4%. So we're really looking at a 3% increase in the world population. Now, that's, you know, if you're looking at 6.9 billion people today, versus that, that's pretty big in terms of the numbers, but it's not like the Muslims are going to become ha you know, half the world's or half the globe's population by 2030. So while the global Muslim population is expected to grow at a faster rate than the non-Muslim population, the Muslim population nevertheless is expected to grow at a slower pace in the next two decades than it did in the previous two decades. From 1990 to 2010, the global Muslim population increased at an average annual rate of 2.2%, and so the next phase of its growth will be at 1.5%. So you, you, we're seeing this slowdown also in the Muslim world. Again, here's just basically breaking this out by region. If you see basic, in 2010, the estimated Muslim population is at 1.6 billion today. Um, and actually, well, we're now in 2012, so that's slightly higher. But you'll see that you know, Asia, most, of, most Muslims are, come from Asia. About 20% of the Muslim population comes from um, the Middle East and North Africa. And these, these numbers map on in terms of the projected rate and projected you know, increases in the next 20 years, where we're going to see the largest increases in the Muslim population are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of the share of the entire Muslim population and in the Americas. The United States will basically, it, its Muslim population is, go, is, is forecasted to triple in the next 20 years because of immigration. Um, a lot of immigrants from Muslim majority countries are entering the United States, um, and the Muslim American birth rates still remain higher than the average uh, birth rates. So the three most uh, dominant countries in the Americas are, of course, the United States, Canada, and who would, who, who can guess the third most populous Muslim America, American state? That includes Latin America and South America. Brazil. Not Brazil. I was surprised too. Argentina, so, so that, that's, in, that's, that's there. And the largest sub-Saharan African country that's probably going to outnumber Egypt by 2030 is going to be Nigeria. So, so here's just a, a chart about also the growth rate. So you'll see, yes, the Muslims are starting out at a, a higher birth rate here uh, at 2.3%. They're going to decline to 1.4%, but, ne but nevertheless, they're still going to be at a, at a much quicker uh, growth rate than the non-Muslim population worldwide. And this basically gives us a sense of, where, you know, in all these countries you're going to see a relative decline across time, um, but because they're all declining at similar rates, you, they're still going to more or less have the same percentages as part of the, 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 the total Muslim population, except the exception here being the Americas, Canada, the United States and Argentina, more or less, are all going to you know, triple in their, their percent. But still, even with the Muslims triple in the United States, what, what percentage of the population are they going to become? Close to 8%. Of course, if you talk to Muslim uh, groups in this country, they'd say closer to 12%. So you know, those, those numbers are still also debated. And we can talk about that, that in Q&A. Um, so, so then what percentage of the Muslim population is more or less youth-based? We often hear about the youth bulge, that this, you know, Muslim populations are predominantly youth-based. And this links up nicely to the kind of the popular portrayal or the popular co coverage in the media of the, you know, the events in the Arab Spring, where more or less what's been out there is that the current events of the Arab Spring are more or less youth-led, youth-based, and you can link them back to the youth bulge. That, in essence, what's happened to these societies is that you had all these factors kind of converge where birth rates, um, birth rates remained for some period of time quite constant. They were high. Life expectancy increased. Um, quality of life improved, so people were living longer, and hence you had, uh, you know, a youth bulge entering the labor force at a at, at the same juncture. So basically, 65 percent. The estimate is about 65 percent of the Muslim population worldwide, and about almost 70 percent of the Arab population is is under the age of 30, right? And so that's an enormous if you may, burden on the state and on the economic sectors, labor markets and whatnot in terms of trying to absorb these citizens into adequate education channels or adequate labor uh, channels or market channels, if you may. So, do, so and, and then, then the, the other kind of like, you know, 
uh, well, when I say historical, co hysterical concern that emerged from that is that if all these Muslims, uh, this, this youth population, if their growth rates weren't declining and they were all going to have children, then you were going to see a much you know, larger expansion of the Muslim population. And in some areas, or at least in some circles, that was deemed as a serious threat to, um, to certain t conditions or you know, projections or whatnot, however you want to formulate that. The truth is, is that if you look at the percentage of the population of the Muslim majority countries, yes, they're stacked pretty heavy, right, in, in, on the youth dimension um, of things, but th th this, this pattern is declining. And if you look at developments in other parts of the world, you see similar trends. It's, it, it just so happens that the Muslim world is lagging behind the rest of the world because of the development trajectory, right? Um, so if you, you know, this is, this is more of a story about not Muslims per se, this is a story about development and economic development and what economic development does. What, you know, what it does basically creates more uh, labor opportunities. Once women enter the labor force, they become better educated, they enter the labor force, they have less children. So more or less the Muslim world lags behind the rest of the world, not so much because of its, 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 its you know, the, the, the Islamic nature of, of the, 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 the Muslim world, but more or less because of the developmental trajectory. And we can talk more about that also in Q&A, but just wanted to give you a sense of what this looks like. Now, really quickly, I'm go we're going to link this back to the Arab world, and this is where um, pa Pascal has also done a lot of research. If we look at the percentage of the population that's under 30, and this is census data from most Arab countries, um, or the, these are countries that we cover in the Arab barometer, which is more or less, you know, countries where we've conducted these large uh, representative sample surveys. Um, but the, th these data are based on census data. What you see more or less is that a good percentage of these populations, especially in a place like Yemen, um, you have the largest segment of the population under the age of 30. Again, you know, so that you have this, these, these large youthful, you know, populations that are unfortunately not doing well on the employment spectrum, not so much because they haven't acquired the necessary skills to enter the labor force because there are no job opportunities. So again, there's this mismatch between skills, between ability, between the idea that if you, uh, if you went and you, you sought an education, if you worked hard, the availability of jobs is not there to absorb the youth demands in a lot of these countries. And this has been a common theme throughout the Arab world. And you know, it links into a lot of the, you know, well, who supports political Islam? Is it this youth population that's really mobilizing behind these movements? And we're gonna talk about that in just a bit. But this gives you a sense about, at least in the Arab world, what the youth bulge looks like. Now, there's been a lot in the media when we, when we think about what's been happening in the Arab Spring, when people have been covering the events of the Arab Spring, there's a few things that have been put, put out there in the media about the nature or the characteristics of the youth of the Arab Spring. Now, these are data from 2006. So the first question here that you guys should ask me is, well, Amani, these are data from 2006 and the Arab Spring just happened in 2011. So how similar or comparable are surveys from 2006 to events in 2011? Let me tell you that we do have new data from 2011, and so what I'm presenting here maps on quite nicely to what we have in 2011. The only thing is that those data are just coming back right now from the field, you know, clean data sets, so I haven't had a chance to really put them in nice slides for you, but you gotta trust me on it when I say that the data map on pretty nicely. So one of the things that's been out there is that, well, this youth population is less religious than their, old, than their parents and than the older cohorts. Um, so we wanted to examine um, how true these assessments were. And so if this scale here is a scale of religiosity that is you know, captured by communal prayer, do people participate in communal prayer? Do people consider themselves religious, religious people? You'll see indeed that the, the younger cohorts do think of themselves as less religious than their than their parents, than the older cohorts. Now, some, somebody might ask, well, so what, right? And that's, I, I don't have an answer. I'm just trying to report what the media was saying that, I mean, I guess that by default, the assumption is that if they were less religious, they're gonna be more likely to be liberal. And if they're more likely to be liberal, that would bode well for the democratic outcome. But we'll come back to the, you know, the logic of that connection in, in a while. I'm just putting things out there, okay? Okay, so then the youth population is more educated and is and more likely to be unemployed. And so we wanted to look at that. If you look at this line here, this, this is the line that catches unemployment. This is the youngest cohort. This is the group between 18 and, and 20, 18 and 25 in the sample. And yes, they are likely to be more unemployed 
than older generations. And then this is the, the oldest of the generations, 50 and above. So this is like where people start retiring, you know, are not necessarily, probably it's fair to assume that they're not necessarily looking for jobs here, but here they are looking for jobs. And yes, they are more likely to be unemployed than the cohort that is older than they are. Now, are they more educated? Well, you know, this is on average, they're not necessarily more educated, but they're not necessarily less educated than other cohorts. So that is, it is a, 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 an educated cohort that is more likely to be unemployed. And here you see the mismatch between the employment, the education and the, the unemployment that, that exists in, uh, among the youth cohort right here. Now, does the youth population, we heard a lot about whether the youth population was, you know, in some accounts that this was a factor or a mobilizer behind political Islamic movements. In other accounts, we heard that the youth population was denouncing, was looking for a third way. That the youth population wasn't pro-regime, it wasn't pro-political Islamic opposition. They were trying to carve for themselves um, a new voice in the political spectrum. So we look at two different indicators here. One is, do, do you believe that Islamic law is suitable for your country, and it's very specific, like you know, Islamic law, not just like vaguely, but like Islamic law that would conform to the way people who endorse political Islamic, you know, the role of political Islam in their societies would accept that, and versus um, a more different kind of measure of it. Do, do you, this is not to say political Islam, but this, this, this tries to capture this idea about tolerance towards others. Do you accept, or would you like to have a neighbor um, um, of another religion? or how should I put it, is it okay to have a neighbor of another religion as your, a person of another religion as your neighbor? Like, is that okay with you? Um, so what you see is that on the tolerance score, the youth population was far more likely to say, yes, it's fine to have a person of another religion as my neighbor. So yes, they are more tolerant than, their, than the older cohorts, but, and the proportion, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I messed that up, sorry. Um, the so so, so actually, they were slightly less tolerant than their older cohorts on the religion aspect, and they were slightly more supportive of political Islam than their older generation. So it wasn't necessarily true that the youth population was denouncing political Islam or was at least trying to carve out, perhaps they're trying to carve out some new voice. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, lot of um, agitation going on within certain political Islamic movements and a lot of divisions emerging between the youth population within the Islamic movements and the older cohort where the youth, so if you look at what's happening with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, they're really trying to carve for themselves a voice within the movement that is distinct from the older generation. Erin, you had a hand up? This is 2006? This is 2006, yeah, still 2006. Youth population and religious identity, um, to the extent that we, there's a question on the Arab barometer that says, do you identify yourself as Arab first or as Muslim first or as your, you know, as your tribe first or your ethnicity first, depending if there's like ethnic uh, differentiation in, in, in that state. The youth population is far more likely to say that they identify as, as Muslim first than like they're, you know, than Egyptian or Jordanian or Yemeni. So that, 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 that is a identity that they find more appealing or at least more, they're more proud of that identity than the national identities. And this idea that the youth population is more likely to have uh, participated in politics or is engaged in politics, we really find little support for the idea that the youth population is more likely to have participated in, in formal political uh, institutions. So when we ask about the percentage of those who voted, the youth population uh, less likely to have voted. Now you might say, well, that was before the Arab Spring. The truth is, even if you look at the elections that came out of Tunisia, if you look at the elections that just came out of Egypt, the, the youth didn't really turn out the way that people thought they would turn out for these elections. So yes, they're more likely to protest, as this slide will show you, but they're not necessarily translating that protest into political action. So this raises the question of, um, you know, if, if we were to globally sample the entire world, would we find youth populations across the globe more likely to protest, or is there something unique about Arab, the Arab youth in terms of what, in terms of their motivations behind their protest behavior in these countries? And that's still an that, that, that's an outstanding question that I don't think we're going to answer here tonight, but it's still one that we should we should ask ourselves. Um, then the, the, the other thing is that what we found, and we were kind of quite surprised by this, is that any which way you, you look at these data, the youth population always tended to be more satisfied with the status quo, with existing regimes, than their, 
then at least the, the, the cohort that was immediately above them, um, the oldest cohorts are probably a little bit more satisfied, but the youth population comes in second. So it's not that the youth population was, you know, really anti-establishment or really anti-opposition, but um, they were they were more satisfied. And you'll see in a moment what what we think is happening with the youth population is not that they were the most disgruntled segments of the society, but they believed that change would bring them most. They had the most to gain if change happened. So it was an opportunity to improve your your status. Not that they were like basically finding the status quo, um, um, uh, you know, unbearable, but that they feel that there's room for improvement moving forward. So this just gives you a sense of where the youth population stands. Um, again, on economic satisfaction, if you ask about, do you believe that the existing economic conditions are good, or and do you believe that the existing economic conditions will get better? Again, the youth population was more optimistic than the older populations moving forward. So it gives us the, this idea that they believe that perhaps with change they can do even better. And so that's why they galvanized and protest uh, against the, the regime. Um, they're not as politically engaged as you might think. They're less engaged than their parents and the older generation. Um, this is just basically general interest in politics and do you follow the media type of questions. And there was this whole thing about maybe this youth population has different understandings of what democracy is or they might, I mean, so for the longest time, and again, this is really taking on the popular portrayal of the Arab Spring, the, uh, the way the Arab Spring was portrayed in the popular media, at least in, 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 in the West, or, and especially the United States, was that this was a new generation that appreciated democracy in ways that the older generation just couldn't appreciate, right? So this was a moment of democratic transformation because now you had a youth population that had learned the virtues of democracy. And the truth is we see nothing to support that, that claim. Here's the youngest cohort. And if we ask them, what, do you, what, what, what does democracy mean to you? What are the primary characteristics of democracy? Is it about elections? Is it about freedom to criticize the government? Is it about income equality? Is it about a government that can provide basic necessities? More or less, you'll see that the way the youngest cohort prioritizes the key aspects of democracy is quite similar to the way the older cohorts prioritize democ uh, democracy. The one thing that you might say is that the, the older cohorts believe governments still should play a key role in providing basic necessities more so than this younger generation. And that's probably because of the social contract that was in existence for a very long time in the Arab world. But in terms of free and fair elections, you know, political versus economic liberties, more or less, there, is an, there, was an there was an appreciation for democracy with the older cohorts. It doesn't seem that this younger cohort has this drastically different opinion of democracy. Yes. And why is the Arab Spring being led by younger people? Okay, so that's, that's, that's the big question. Is the Arab Spring being led by younger people? So we just got back data from Egypt. And, and the data from Egypt asked people basically, did you protest in Tahrir Square? Did you protest through these different, you know, junctures of the protest movement cycle in Egypt. So the truth is, it wasn't the youngest population out there protesting. It was, your pop, your, it was the age group between 25 and 35 were the most likely cohort to be out there protesting. And it wasn't your unemployed, disgruntled people or um, your uneducated people out there protesting. The truth is, the Tahrir Square demonstrations were middle class. They were people who were connected to the internet, but then we have to basically say, is, you know, what causes what here, right? Because if I can access internet and I have a smartphone and I'm on Google, I might be wealthy middle class to begin with. So, right, there's this, but the, if you're looking at who participated in Tahrir Square, Tahrir Square, especially in Egypt, it was a middle class movement. Um, and it was an older cohort. And there was a lot of support for political Islam among that cohort. Now, Tunisia, on the other hand, what we're finding is still, it's, it's still more middle, it's, it's middle class, but it's lower, more li lower middle class than the Egyptian um, uh, protesters. So, 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 am I dismissing the role of the youth in the protests? No. But what I'm saying is that I think a lot was made about the role of the youth in the protests. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, how old is cohort one? Eighteen to twenty, eighteen to twenty-five here. Okay, so it would be cohort two. Cohort two, which is the one that really championed the protests. 
But can I say the the the, the one thing where the 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 portrayal and the, where I think everybody was right is that the youth cohort cohort one was disproportionately more likely to have access to the internet was more likely to be involved in social media. So that became a vehicle through which they disseminated information. So it does appear to have played a, 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 a huge role for mobilizing certain youth segments of the population and whatnot. And certainly in Tunisia, it was the technology and the ability to, to disseminate. And so they had thumb drives you know, circulated in these protest movements that the government couldn't capture and whatnot. So it really became a way of disseminating information and providing information to protesters that the government always controlled or checked prior. So in that sense, there was this, uh, this, this correlation, if you may. I'm probably going on for too long. Okay. Um, so I guess, so in conclusion, the Muslim population is not, is not, it's growing, but it's not growing at this overwhelming rate. It's certainly, Muslims are not gonna be sweeping through Europe at any time. Um, uh, and in fact, those percentages in Europe will remain, the, the percentage of the Muslim population in Europe will remain quite the same between 2010 and 2030. The, pu the youth population is growing, and it matters somewhat in the, the Arab Spring, but again, we, I think we're giving way too much credit to the youth population, um, and I think that's good. If it, the, the, the only implication of, of doing that is that if we continue to focus on the youth population, we're probably missing other crucial components behind the Arab Spring. Um, some popular portrayals, portrayals were accurate, others were less so. So thank you so much, and I will. All right. Um, well, I have, I have a difficult job. It's um, it. It's, it's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a qualitativist, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, and so my first reaction when I read that report is a reaction of interest, but of some, somewhat far interest, and um, I'm actually more interested in the methodology uh, than in the, in the, in the conclusions of the, of the report. Um, but my, my, my first reaction, I guess, is the reaction um, uh, uh, William Foote White uh, got from his interviewees when he was uh, doing field work in, uh, in Boston's uh, North End uh, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, and they told him once, um, look, uh, if you ask us when, what, why, you're not going to go very far away with our responses because we, we will tend to hide, we will tend to say something else than the truth, so you better hang out with us stay with us for a long while, and then you will get, uh, on top of a nice experience, you will get an answer to all these questions. So that's always my reaction when I see, um, I mean, especially, the, 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 I really like the slide about political engagement, and I, I like even more your comment about it, and the fact that you say, well, political engagement, it's questions like, um, do you follow the media? Uh, are you interested in politics? I guess that there are ways to measure political engagement uh, probably more efficiently than by asking this question. That, that seems pretty far removed from, from what political engagement is in countries where, you know, a lot of associations are out there and, and, and you can basically measure political engagement by the rate of participation in the Muslim Brotherhood movement, uh, be they public, public and out there on, on, on the public space, or be they more, um, you know, less... Uh, less obviously uh, present, like in Saudi Arabia, for instance, where there is a very strong uh, Muslim Brotherhood movement, but, uh, but it's, it's, you, you actually need to spend some time there to see that there is some engagement in the, in the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. and asking questions uh, about political motivations, political engagement in a country uh, like Saudi Arabia, or in countries where you have a lot of repression, might, might lead to, to, to misleading uh, conclusions. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, I sound so harsh. <laughs> no. it's, uh, it's absolutely not a harsh comment I'm, I'm, I'm doing. But um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to, to, to bring my, my point of view as a qualitativist. It's, uh, uh, so my, my, I, I guess I have three sets of comments. Uh, the first one is more methodological. Um, the second one has to do with the Arabian Peninsula. And this, the third one uh, is about, well, it's about this, this, the, the whole argument of the youth, youth bulge and the relationship between the youth bulge and uh, political unrest. So the first question is, um, well, wh when I was reading the report, uh, I was, uh, uh, the first question that popped to my mind was, uh, how do you count Muslims? And that's a, it's, it's a very simple question, but it's a very tricky question. Uh, counting people by religion is uh, not a recent endeavor, but doing it scientifically uh, might be more recent, actually. I think that the first um, attempt at systematically collecting religious um, uh, demographics in the world 
is 2008. That's four years ago. I mean, it's a very recent endeavor. And, uh, well, you might not realize it at first, but the Pew Report is actually extremely bold. Uh, it's bold because counting people by religion uh, is extremely problematic. It's, it's problematic because, well, many national censuses don't include religion. Um, and less than half the country censuses in the world include a question on religion. Here I have the slide on uh, uh, the, the, the countries in, in, in Europe that include um, religion in their censuses. And you can see that, for instance, in Western Europe, with the exception of Ireland, um, um, uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, Portugal, uh, and Switzerland, uh, you don't have many countries asking the question of religion. And that's due to, well, to historical reasons, to the fact that um, in, 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 in France, the religious wars are still very present in everybody's mind. And, uh, well, the story is even more uh, uh, painful uh, when you talk about Germany. So it's problematic to, to base your, uh, uh, your <clears throat> observations on uh, national censuses. And religious censuses in many places is a taboo. So you have to rely on surveys for the, for the other half, which, is, which comes with a bunch of other questions. Um, all kinds of difficulties linked with, for instance, the quality of the sample, uh, linked with the response rate, uh, linked with the geographical representation of your survey, linked with the design of the, question, the questionnaire, and so on and so forth. Here I have, for instance, uh, um, a comparison between the Bulgarian census with, uh, with not that many options. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, other, not stated. And um, a, a, a survey question, uh, again, asking in, in Bulgaria, uh, which is actually more uh, detailed. Uh, do you belong to a religious denomination? That sounds like a, a fairly reasonable question to ask beforehand. So the survey asks it, the census doesn't. Uh, well, in other cases, it's the, it's the contrary, right? The survey is, is poorer than the uh, census. So to, to, to sum it up, um, I mean, it's a work in progress. It's a fascinating endeavor. And, uh, and, and I think us uh, non-professional uh, readers of the Pew Report, uh, I mean, might not see it at first sight, at, at, at first, but it's, it's a very bold report. My second set of uh, remarks is about uh, the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So it's the, the region that interests us uh, more as, uh, at um, NYU Abu Dhabi. But also, it's a very interesting region in the report because the Arabian Peninsula comes up at, at being uh, at both extremes uh, in terms of uh, demographic, tra uh, demographic transition uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, so, and we have two distinct patterns in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, the Gulf on the one hand and, the, uh, uh, and Yemen on the other hand. Uh, so the Gulf presents, well, the lowest um, uh, countries with the lowest fertility. Wow. Here, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Kuwait and Bahrain, you have among the lowest um, uh, fertility, fertility rates uh, in, the, uh, in the Muslim world. Um, um, the uh, lowest infant mortality, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, United Emirates, uh, Oman, uh, almost everybody is here. Uh, the highest life, life expectancy at birth, uh, uh, Kuwait, UAE, Oman, Bahrain, Qatar, again, you have, you have pretty much everybody. Um, the largest gains from immigration, United Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia uh, and Oman. Saudi Arabia is a, is a tricky case. I, I, I won't talk too much about it, but it's, it's, it's almost perfectly in between, between the, the Gulf pattern and the, and the, uh, the Yemeni pattern. Um, and the highest median age, which is not, uh, not self-understandable, right? I mean, you, you, you tend to assume that in the Gulf, uh, people are gonna be very uh, young. It's not the case. If you count everybody in, uh, uh, well, you, you find the, the highest made in age in the whole Muslim world. UAE, for instance, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, and uh, Bahrain. Um, so, if you look at the bigger picture, oh yeah, and there is the, the and those are the most urbanized countries of the, of the sample. Uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Um, so, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, uh, these features are between the rest of the MENA region and uh, European countries. So the Gulf is a place in uh, between, with an important twist uh, because population growth is very high and it's pushed up by immigration and by fertility. Um, Yemen, on the other side, uh, is uh, the other extreme. 
You have in Yemen among the highest fertility, the lowest median, median age, uh, the highest percentage of population between 15 and 29, and the least, it's, well, it's among the least urbanized countries uh, uh, in the Muslim world. So <clears throat> it means that we have an interesting picture at the level of the Arabian Peninsula. The six countries of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, are really scared of Yemen, of Yemeni numbers. Uh, and they've been so for a very long time. I mean, when Yemen was, was the only uh, communist country in the Arab world, uh, it was already the case. When um, uh, Al-Qaeda, for instance, after having been uh, almost entirely defeated in Saudi Arabia, took refuge in Yemen, it was the case again. Uh, and you have, I mean, demographics is a profession in Saudi Arabia, in such countries as Saudi Arabia. Uh, demographics is, uh, is, is a common, um, is, is an object of public concern since at least uh, the 1920s in the Arab world, uh, with um, famous researchers in Egypt about, uh, uh, you know, pressed bodies in the in the very uh, um, narrow Nile Valley, and it's an object of public concern in uh, um, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, since basically since the middle of the of of of, of the um, of the Cold War since since the 60s and the 70s. Um, so Saudis. Uh, yeah, and for, for instance, Prince Nayef, when he was Minister of the Interior in the, in, the, in, the, in the early 2000s, even tried to build a wall between Saudi Arabia and uh, Yemen. So in a way, I mean, Yemen scares uh, the GCC countries just as the Palestinian territories scare Israel. And, it's, it, and, and uh, uh, Yemeni numbers trigger the same kind of measures uh, that um, Palestinian territories trigger uh, in um, Israeli power circles. It's, it's quite an interesting uh, figure. And uh, in response to that challenge, to that Yemeni challenge, Saudis tend to inflate their population figures uh, in order to match the Yemeni demographics and to show to the world that, well, they are powerful enough, enough to, 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 you know, to resist a Yemeni invasions or, or the Yemeni uh, power, the, 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 the power of the numbers. So it, uh, I wanted to put some pictures, so um, I, I didn't know how to do that, so that's Louis the 14th. Uh, French kings were more straightforward than uh, Saudi monarchs because they were just not publishing uh, their demographics. Uh, France is uh, probably the, the, the first country in, in Western Europe that conducted um, state censuses uh, for uh, fiscal purposes, and the French kings were absolutely not publishing those figures uh, for fear of uh, basically being uh, being seen in, 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 a, in a not very favorable light and being attacked uh, by, uh, by powers that would be more numerous than there. Uh, it, it was not very reasonable because at that time France was, was, was the most dynamic demographic uh, power in, in Western Europe, but they were probably, you know, being French and is, 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 is self, <laughs> it's a self-hating business, right? So I, I guess they were like, <laughs> we're, not in, we're not numerous enough. Well, they were numerous enough. They were much more numerous than anybody else in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, so Saudi kings, uh, another picture, uh, have to publish them. They have to publish their, um, their figures, and so therefore they push them up. So again, that, that's another problem I mean, in terms of methodology, because you can't really rely on whatever is published in Riyadh in terms of population figures, which is not the case of the Pew Report anyway. They, they relied on, on surveys for Saudi Arabia. Um, so my, my third um, set of comments, and I will, I will stop there, is about the youth bulge and the link between demographics and, and politics. So interestingly enough, it's, it's through the lens of the youth bulge that uh, the Pew Report was perceived in the US press. Here is an article in, uh, in Time magazine, and it's very uh, clear by the, uh, when you see the picture that, um, well, it's Sunni, Sunni Muslim supporters of Lebanon's former prime minister, Saad al-Hariri, wave flags during what they uh, call a day of anger in Tripoli. So <clears throat> demographics, day of anger. It's interesting that they didn't choose um, a, a picture from the Arab Spring, uh, although the, the article was published in January uh, 2011, and there were plenty of figures, plenty of, um, of, uh, of pictures to, um, to, to portray this sort of relationship, but they still portray a day of um, anger. So what's the argument here? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm any, you, you, you summed it up very well, but I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to to say something more, which is really, which is really difficult. But uh, I think, I mean, when, when I see youth bulge, um, I remember my lessons in middle school and, uh, and basically my, my lessons about uh, demographic history in Europe and the fact that youth bulge sounds to my ears like 
demographic transition. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it, 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 it seems that it's the same, exactly the same phenomenon that is described, but from a catastrophist point of view. Point of view. And here I, I, I cannot but agree totally with your uh, uh, presentation. Youth bulge means more bodies, less resources, hence political crisis. Well, it seems that it's just the catastrophist name for uh, the more amicable and the more classical notion of uh, demographic transition. Here it's the demographic transition. Um, it's, an it's an approximation of, uh, of, 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 uh, of a figure for demographic transition in, uh, in, uh, in uh, England. Uh, in, uh, so from the, the 1760s to... Um, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's, that has nothing to do. It's, it's, it's the 18th century uh, England. It's from the, from the, the mid-18th century to the mid-19th uh, century. That's, yeah, bad slide. Um, so what's the link between demographic transition and political revolution? When here again we could compare between the French um, demographic uh, transition and, no, between, between the French model of demographic transition and the English model. And I'm going to make the picture, I'm going to simplify the picture to the extreme, but it's, it's, it's basically to ask a question and, and to launch the, the, the discussion. Uh, well, the, the English model is more bodies, more resources because of the Industrial Revolution, uh, more freedom, and therefore no revolution, but the triumph of industrial capitalism. In France, the model is quite different. It's much more bodies because France's population was more numerous. Um, the same resources as before because the Industrial Revolution is slower and it comes later, and much less freedoms. Uh, therefore, the political revolution precedes the Industrial Revolution. So my question is, and I, I will leave, leave the floor open to, to, to questions from the, from the audience, uh, A, is youth bulge another name for demographic transition? And why don't we say very simply demographic transition mm -hmm. and sort of pierce this bubble of, uh, mm -hmm. of you know, the youth uh, scare? And B, uh, is the French case relevant when one looks at the uh, Arab revolutions? Enlightened but unused, right? It's, it's, uh, and I really like that, that slide about, uh, about education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your study is in the Arab barometers, yeah, uh, on some eight different countries you follow. I guess one thing that would be interesting is, is to look at the, the variations across them. And I was wondering if you could share with us some noticeable kind of uh, cases which are, you know, outliers that, that look very different in terms of the pattern of youth, uh, either political participation or attitudes or, or what have you. Uh, and then part of the reason I, I mentioned that is, uh, is that. Uh, when I was you know, looking at both, both of what you guys were commenting on, you know, this argument that the Arab Spring is driven by and the whole series of factors around this, uh, this, the youth population. Just anecdotally, when you look, up, look around, I mean, you know, the countries that experience the Arab Spring kind of most uh, prominently, Tunisia, Yemen, Bahrain, Libya, Egypt, just you know, these are very, very, very different demog uh, uh, countries demographically. So, um, the correlation with percentage of you know, uh, these uh, urbanization, all these factors, just mm -hmm. isn't there at all. Um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe talk to compare the case, compare these cases uh, to one another. Yeah, um, I mean, so so on the youth component, so on these charts that we presented, or. There's not much variation in terms of you know between countries in terms of the, the what the youth population you know whether or not the youth population is more politically engaged basically the dimensions that you saw here in the presentation so we can confidently say that there's not one or two cases driving the results this way or one or two cases that are uh, anomalous where there are variations across cases is that okay so now you have about. 30% of the youth population protesting, or 30% of the youth population that is only politically engaged, what does that youth population look like, right? And in some cases, it's more, more highly educated, so Egypt, um, and in some cases, they're more high income, and in other cases, they're low, more low income. Uh, I suspect that, that if that we were able to set, pull the youth population in Syria, we would find that they were less urban now, 
um, what the, in terms of who's, who's, who's leading the protest. So in terms of then the, the patterns of protest that have emerged, if you may, um, in each of the countries, there it's really important to take, and getting back to Pascal's point, it's really important to take the, the way these regimes have organized themselves in societies to win support. Um, and if they have, like, for example, the loyalty of the urban sectors, as, the, as Bashar does in Syria, then the protesters are going to be from the rural areas, um, especially the youth population, where th that's where they can mobilize more um, effectively. So I think that's kind of, I, I think that's basically how, where you would find the variation. In terms of just aggregate size of, sizes of the youth population, how they compare to the older populations. I think more or less these are the trends. And we really, you know, we did country fixed effects. We, we did a variety of, you know, robustness controls to make sure that there weren't any one, you know, and there wasn't any one country driving the results in any one direction. Yeah, hi, um, <clears throat> thank you for both your presentations. Um, my question is also for Professor Jamal, um, and it has to do with sort of this question of uh, categorization in this, in this polling data. I think, uh, Professor Menoray was talking about you know, category of Muslim and how that might be problematic. I actually wanted to draw attention maybe to the, the idea of the category of the youth um, because I feel like um, a lot of the uh, sort of qualitative discussion, both in the press and also in, in sort of academic circles of, of, of youth, uh, maybe uh, entails a different uh, sort of subset of people than your, your data is talking about. So I conducted research this, this summer in Egypt, and most of the people who I interviewed who self-identified and who also had been identified in the press as youth actually uh, would fall to the age range of 25 to 30. So the leaders of groups like April 6, which is sort of the big youth group, and other sort of youth groups that are often talked about when, when, when in discussion of, of the sort of youth momentum behind the revolution, most of the members of these groups actually were in this second cohort that you talked about. So if you, you know, were to broaden your definition of youth to include the first and the second cohort, that might lead to sort of if conclusions about what was behind this, this uprising, these uprisings. So I, I guess I want to maybe... And that no, no, no. I think that that's a really good point, and it's one that we struggled with because if we're already dealing with a so if, if about sixty or seventy percent of the populations are between the ages, I mean, so I want to make sure that first of all I emphasize that you're I think you're right on target, right? Um, but if we know that about sixty-five to seventy percent of the populations are in that eighty to thirty category, to say that that's now the youth population, it's not giving us much more analytical leverage. So what we really wanted to get at is that. Um, in this analysis, if indeed th th this younger generation that had more access to the internet and more access to the social media, was it really behind the protests and it wasn't the case. So this older generation, you know, April 6th and like some of the elites in these movements, yes, they were well networked and whatnot, but if then we look at other people in that, that segment of the population that's 25 to 35 or 25 to 30, they're not as well connected as the youth, the, what we call here the youth, the 18, 18 to 24 group. Um, but it was that older cohort that was out there protesting. So if anything, it leads us to believe at least, at the very minimal, we need to nuance this understanding of what the youth is. And again, what we try to do actually in the presentation, this presentation is really based on, a, on, on, a, on, a, on an article. You know, when we talk about the youth population, within this rubric of the Arab Spring, what, what are we really, what, what does the youth population stand for? Is it more politically engaged? Is it a more vibrant cohort? What is this youth population doing, right, that might, might lead us to believe that it's different than the older generations? And what we're finding is that there's not much, you know, I mean, what I'd like to say is that I don't believe that there's transformations that happened on the ground with this youth population. I don't believe that, you know, you have a youth population that has become more galvanized or more appreciative or, or, or more demanding of democracy. I think those those characteristics have always been present in, in various cohorts in the Arab world. I think that there are structural dynamics that have shifted. So it's the, so that's kind of where I'm going with this analysis. Let me add something mm -hmm. uh, along the same lines. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with what you said. I mean, youth is but a name, right? It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I'm, Something, some, somebody here. <laughs> but, uh, and what was interesting in the Arab world is that youth, as, as, as a category of discourse and as a political category, emerged in the. I mean, if we, if we look at the Arabian Peninsula, which is the place I know, I know best, it's, it emerged in, in, in the 70s. 
uh, it might emerge a bit before in, in, in places like Egypt and Lebanon, but it won't be before the, the 20s and 30s. So it's a fairly recent category of discourse and a fairly recent uh, also scientific category. And I mean, during my fieldwork in Saudi Arabia, I was really interested in, 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 in exploring the, the various dimensions of what youth means uh, for various people. And, 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 and well, it turns out that very classically, youth uh, depends on one, I mean, the fact that you're young or not depends on, on your position in society. It also de depends on, sometimes on moments. Some people who, uh, when they are with their wife and children, are considered as being either professionals or, uh, you know, they are considered as, as being in their social status, uh, a, 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 a professor, uh, you know, whatever, are considered as being youth, Shabbat, when they are alone or when, when they are just hanging out with friends. So it's, 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 really, a, it's really a very a very plastic, very moving um, uh, notion. And I would say, I mean, that youth is also used by political regimes and also sometimes by, by, by Western media to dismiss political movements. And, you know, there is the classical reaction in Saudi Arabia uh, when you have a political protest, oh, Padol Shabbat, those are just young people. They are just, you know, playing around. And sometimes it's, it's, it's used in that way. So I, I totally agree with, with, with what you say. I mean, and I really think that we need to shift away from youth as, as an analytical category right. here. It's, right. uh, the question is about demographics and politics, it's not about the youth culture. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, during the surveys, you said that the, the, could be young generation, 18 to 25, or less for the Muslim parliament than the older generation. And was there any studies made? Was that found interesting? Any studies made on why that is? And, uh, did, did their access to, to the internet and other, uh, other aspects actually affect their uh, views of, uh, their, uh, of their interests? So, 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 so the initial analysis, I mean, so the idea is that if, you know, again, one of the popular things that if you have access to the internet, if you're more global as a citizen, if you see that, you know, like miraculously, all of a sudden you have access to the internet, therefore you've become much more tolerant and therefore you've begun to show, share universal values. The truth is, is that, I mean, so one of the things we try to take on is that, you know, there's a self-selection mechanism going on. If I have access to the internet, I, I might, you know, I can imagine people's like rigid identities being solidified and their like rigid beliefs because they go, can go visit the websites that they want to to visit. So we found there is no correlation between internet access and level level of tolerance. Having said that, does it mean that they, you know, we also don't want to go the other direction and say, oh, well, see, now this you have a whole new cohort entering Arab politics that's going to be less tolerant and more political Islamist, you know, however we define that than their parents. We think what's going on is that if you look at all of these socialization studies or cohort studies from modernization onwards from Europe, as, as Pascal was saying also, you know, the youth tend to be more rigid in their ideologies and identities in many ways than their parents, believe it or not, right? So that's what we were a bit perplexed about with the Arab Spring, or at least I was, is that all of a sudden, you know, it was time to embrace democracy in the Arab world because now we had the right citizens to do that. and. It, it doesn't appear, you know, not, not to say that I'm not for democracy and that we should embrace democracy in the Arab world, but it's not certainly because we, there was an education curve or a cultural value kind of, you know, uh, shift in the, the Arab world that now bodes well for democracy. So, so that's kind of what I really want to wanna hammer. I think a lot of what's going on with this quote-unquote youth category is youth-specific. If we were to pull people in the United States, I think we'd find similar trends. And again, I don't have figures, it's just a, you know, what about the evolution of the more fundamentalist Islam, so whatever, conservative Islamic parties in countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, etc., and their impact on the ground on the terrain, you know, and, and all that that was said about, you know, mosques were being the only places where you could talk versus, you know, all that. So I think I yeah no I think that's right on target. I think you have you so this is where I think there's where the youth might have been more susceptible, if you may, to the Islamic message. Not because like they were like objects of brainwashing, but more or less you have an unemployment crisis. You have citizens that have just a lot of time on their hands. I mean, if you're an unemployed citizen in Egypt and you might find a job that's not going to pay you much um, versus just hanging out all day. 
you know, if you can hang out at a local nadi or club or like play pool or soccer or whatnot, uh, go to the mosque. I mean, that's ways to kill your time. And, and a lot of the, the work on the ground, as we saw in the election, wasn't being done by, you know, what we call liberal secular movements. It was being done, done by these Islamic movements. I mean, everybody was just surprised um, by the Salafist popularity on the ground. And the truth is they've been out there mobilizing for a long time. So now if we were to sample all the youth, you know, the, all the, I, I, and this is not even unique to the youth, though. If we sampled all the people who voted Islamists in this election, how, what percentage of them are really committed to the Islamic ideology? I would argue, based on the data I've seen, no more than 15%. But how many of them are sympathetic to the movement? You saw the, the results, but the reasons are varied. Uh, social services, uh, an honest opposition, uh, an opposition that has stood up against the regime. So I'm anti-regime. I don't really think the other opposition movements are going to do much, but this one might. So there were the, the reasons were varied. Um, so, and so you, ha you apply that to the youth population and you find a similar trend. Pascal, I don't know if you want to say something about the, the Saudi opposition or the youth in, in, in Saudi Arabia. You, you, you observe uh, actually the same dynamics in Saudi Arabia. And I, I just want to take an example for this dynamics of uh, competition and, 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 and uh, yeah, competition between Salafists and, uh, and, uh, and Muslim brothers. I mean, in 2005, the, during the, the, the municipal elections in Saudi Arabia, the municipal elections were, were organized in three waves. So it was first Riyadh. Uh, and the central regions, second the, the oriental province, and third the, uh, the western province. So the, the Muslim brothers won the elections in, the, in, the, in Riyadh, in the central region, which triggered a very intense mobilization of Salafis in the eastern region. Uh, very interestingly because at the very beginning the Salafis were opposing the very notion of elections, uh, and so they, 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 they did everything to win the elections during the second phase. Um, which is a very interesting dynamic because Riyadh is much more Salafi if you look at, at the composition of the local Islamic movement than the, 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 the eastern region, which is open to influences from you know, Iran and, and the Gulf and so on and so forth, and where the, the Muslim Brotherhood is much more powerful. So it's, you know, it's, it's a sort of reversed uh, uh, image right, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, between the, the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood. And then they, they, they reached a sort of an agreement in the Hejaz and so they divided the they divided the, 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 the gains between themselves. So yeah, it's um, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. yes. And to clarify, is there any difference between the youth and, and older populations in terms of supporting the regime change in, 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 in the countries? Uh, well, I mean, what we found was the the middle ca categories, the middle cohorts, if you may, were mo more for regime change than the than the the tail ends, the younger or the older generations. Um, I mean, the youth population systematically said that it, it thought it could do better, you know, it, it if it had the economic opportunities or the employment opportunities or the education opportunities that it could do better. So in that sense, you know, they're probably more committed to qualitative changes that will positively impact their lives. And so if that's going to come through because of regime change, they will support it. But they weren't opposed to regime change either. So so make sure that, yeah. If there are no other questions, I thank you both. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I did want to say, hi. The Pasco pointed out that the methodology of this report. So I was a consultant. I was not involved with the methodology. And what this, you know, so I received the report after they did it and was asked to comment on it. And you know, some as a you know, so I didn't have anything to do with how this was conceived. But not that I'm being defensive or anything. So I make sure that that a that was clear. But number two is the methodology on this report is like almost 100 pages. Like you probably saw it. It's 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 very bold. It's very technical. It's very mechanical. So if anybody is interested in getting confused tonight, <laughs> read the methodology. But nobody's done this type of work, as Pascal pointed out. So that's where it's really innovative in that sense. Mm. Can, can I ask you, uh, so the the Pew you know, survey is all, all over the countries, right? In, in the world, I guess, right? Right. So um, so the Pew is either either Saudi Arabia or Syria and Iran and so forth. 
And the year being, did you have a chance to check, uh, look at their results for the, the countries in the Arab barometer and see if the uh, results correlate? And more or less, the, 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 the results map on nicely. Like in terms of like the percentage of people say that they're Muslim versus Christian, things of that sort. We, there is convergence. We're not seeing like, oh, you know, they must have done it. You know, I mean, you know, I guess it's, it's good for both of us that we're not seeing these really great divergent results that would lead us. I mean, everything's within the margin of error. Yeah, but, so the Pew's only asking what your religion is. They're right. not asking anything about religiosity or political. Well, in, in the, for this report only, it's like how you identify. It's based on how you identify. And their global attitudes surveys, they do ask about religiosity. Mm -hmm. So now we, now we can officially end it. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Thank you.